Welcome to the Reverberations Podcast, where we explore the human experience and the journey of self-discovery. What is good, everyone? Welcome to another season of Reverberations. It's an honor to be back with you. We're just going to jump right into this. This podcast is dedicated to those that identify with the masculine, though by no means necessary are we limiting this podcast to any one group or demographic. My work extends across the board, though my core belief is that if we can heal the masculine, we can create a massive shift in the direction that we're headed. Women, this is also for you to better understand our depths and to hold space for us and our growth. Men, this is for us to honor, value, activate, and express our inner fire that is either laid dormant or that we have been fearful of fully embodying. Our passion, our purpose, our presence has an open invite to explore a full fuck yes of what lights us up from within so that we can experience it throughout. And believe me, I've been there before. The wounded masculine, the poster child for Mr. Nice Guy. And for those of you that haven't listened to previous episodes of the podcast, let me just share a little bit of my backstory. My mom had me a week after her 18-year-old birthday in her senior year of high school. My dad left at six months old. My mom got together with my stepfather when I was two years old. Now, all of these things carried on their own individual storylines, though the path of alcoholism, abuse, years of conditioning embedded unhealthy and destructive patterns. Then there was the other path, the path that led me to my path of service, where our greatest weakness reveals our greatest strength, our traumas reveal our gifts. I'm grateful that my journey was focused on the latter, though it was plagued by the former for years. My grandfather and uncles were incredible role models, and I wouldn't take any of that back. I'm honored that I did have them to pave the way and to be a guide in this lifetime, though the men that were closest to me were anything but. That said, when I was younger, just like anybody else, wanted nothing but to be loved and feel accepted, like I belonged. And tennis provided that for me. At a very young age, I was a highly competitive player by the time I was six years old and sponsored by Wilson by the time I was 11, though that wasn't enough. No matter what I accomplished, no matter what I did, no matter what I achieved, whether it was in tennis, whether it was in music, whether it was in chorus, whether it was in business, whether it was in poetry, I still wasn't noticed. I still didn't have a place. Again, I didn't feel like I belonged in my own home, in my own family, in my own skin. Even though I took on his last name, excelled at the sport that he taught, all I ever wanted was to be seen, to be supported, to feel like I mattered, that I just wasn't my mom's son. This relationship with my stepfather, the absent father in my life, along with the relationship with my young mother, contributed to the incessant seeking for approval, constantly looking to be validated, to be accepted for who I am and the value that I bring to the table, that I offer. I felt like I could never measure up. I wasn't good enough. I remember the lofty expectations that I set for myself at eight years old. I was one of the top-ranked players in New England for the age group of 12 and under. Again, that wasn't enough. I needed to be ranked nationally. I needed to set my sights on being a top 10 player in the world. Now, some will say it was my drive to succeed, and that's what we need to excel to the next level. That's what takes us to the pro status. I will not discount that at all, though there was also the drive to prove that I was worthy, that I was worthy of love, that I was worthy to be seen, that I was accepted, that I belonged. And I loved tennis. I loved every bit of it, every minute that I spent on that court. I truly loved it. I was all in. I did it for me. I chose it until I didn't. And it wasn't because I no longer loved it. I left it because the passion I felt for it, the effort I gave to it, being better mentally and physically, went unseen, unmet. All that mattered was how I performed, how I showed up, that I got the trophy, that I was able to be talked about, patted on the back. It could be said that because tennis didn't pan out, that I deepened into my fuck yes, my why. Why the fuck am I here? One of the first recollections of My deeper yes came when I was five years old. 
I looked in my parents' room. I noticed my mom holding back tears on the edge of her bed. I was like, what's wrong? She just brushed it off. Well, I don't remember exactly what she said. It was along the lines of like, it's okay, I'm fine. And I knew it wasn't. It wasn't okay. Not even close. Not even remotely close. Though I just brushed it off. I sat on her bed. I held her. And whatever I said, I just remember her looking at me. And the whole energy shifted. A feeling of relief, of peace, of ease. Even if it was just for a moment. That feeling, I'll never forget, it's what has carried me to this day. That feeling of witnessing someone shift energetically from despair, from anger, from being so hurt to realizing that everything's going to be all right. That we got this. That was the moment that my coaching career began. At the same time, my unhealthy relationship patterns emerged. I continued to seek approval from others in relationships to get that feeling. I began placing others' needs in front of my own, sacrificing my personal power to play the role of the victim, disconnecting from men, masculine energy, wanting to be the exact opposite of my parents. Though because I was put on a pedestal with my level of awareness and emotional maturity and my athletic ability, it set up never being able to live up to my potential. And with the years of addiction and abuse that followed, it laid the groundwork for unhealthy relating my own trials and tribulations in my own life. But finding my way, navigating through pain in search of my purpose, my dharmic path. So I'll never forget that moment where I walked out of my house when my stepfather said that I was basically a glorified social worker. And I turned and said, I will never sacrifice my ideals for an imposed reality. That was the spark. When I knew that I had something different, I had something more to offer, that I wanted to be of service to this world, to make it a better place. Though money, success, the white picket fence, the big house, the fancy cars, that was the definition of success. Though that's not definition of success for me. Of course, those things are nice. I just didn't subscribe to it. I'm in full support of abundance and wealth, without a doubt, as this universe is fully abundant and there is enough available for everyone that is here. It was just the conditioning that got to me, that I would never make it, that I wouldn't be good enough, that I needed to fit in. I felt so out of place. Thankfully, during my earlier years, Music, writing, poetry, they were my savior. That's what allowed me to dial in. That's what allowed me to have a healthy expression of what was going on within. Though my relationships weren't healthy. I was a counselor for my friends. I was constantly put in the friend zone. Like that, just a friend? Yeah, that was me. And like I said, I was a poster child for Mr. Nice Guy. Because I just wanted everyone around me be happy. I wanted to recreate that feeling over and over again because I knew that I could. I knew I had that ability. But it's also not my responsibility and I just couldn't figure that out. So there was many years of where there was patterns repeated throughout my life of toxic shame, self-worth issues, feelings of never being good enough, perfectionism yet playing it safe with an occasional outlandish risk, the savior complex, sexual dysfunction, unhealthy ego, and deep insecurities, that harsh, relentless inner critic, self-sabotage, constantly needing to excel or be the best or not do it at all. I questioned my very existence, even though I felt at the core of my being that I had it, that it was there. But that yes man, that people pleaser, you know, that energy just kept on eating at me. Where I wasn't giving to myself, I wasn't feeding myself, I wasn't feeding my soul's yes, my heartfelt desire, my intimate and expansive vision, which only led me to being betrayed, cheated on, abandoned, abused mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, having marginal successes plagued by sabotaging thoughts and behaviors. 
the blame and the shame along with the constant, oh, you're so talented. You have so much to offer. You're so this, you're so that. And the older I got, I felt like I was running out of time, that I was missing my chance, that I was washed up. You know, that overwhelm and the added pressure to perform and live up to this false, unrealistic, externalized platform that had nothing to do with me or even what I truly wanted. Or if I did want it, it still had little to do with me and what I desired. It was me living up to somebody else's expectations or somebody else's version of me or somebody's perception of how they see me. And the relationships that I went into, they only amplified this. And then finally, when a healthy partnership did come forward, it brought it all to the surface. Every single bit of it. The deep, the dark, the nasty. There was no avoiding it. As much as I felt safer than ever, I didn't want to lose the one thing that brought the deepest affection, that sacred divine union in human form. Everything that I know to be true, though due to my unresolved trauma and the work that didn't get worked, I had to perform. I had to do it right. I had to be good enough. I had to fix everything. So I shut down. I wasn't the strong man. I wasn't the savior. I didn't meet the expectations. I didn't meet my own expectations, really. So what if she found out who I really was inside? My weaknesses, my faults, my failures, my insecurities, my darkness. So I muted my fire. The fire was all but put out as it raged within and came out sideways. I didn't know how to embrace my sacred masculinity. I'd studied it. I knew all about it. I was able to teach it. I was able to be it by myself. My personal power, my sexual assertiveness, my healthy boundaries, reverent communication, the honor and value that I had for myself. Where did it all go? So I fought for a version of myself that I wasn't being. I dug in my heels in self-preservation. My scared little five-year-old boy started having a tantrum while the wisdom of my soul stepped in and put me a time out, was like, dude, check yourself. What the hell are you doing? Who have you become? What have you become? How have you allowed yourself to get here? Everything you ever wanted is in front of you. And you just completely shut down. And I beat myself up over that for the longest time. Though I'm so grateful that my years dedicated to the journey of self-discovery, emotional intelligence, relationship dynamics, integrative wellness, journey work, that set me up to receive the most advanced curriculum in this incarnation. I'll tell you what. The work was now working me on every level. My soul was on fire, purifying me from within each and every single cell being recalibrated, my whole nervous system being harmonized, revitalized, while I was literally walking the coal, staring creation dead in the eyes, praying for salvation. Asking, what the fuck am I doing here? Who am I if I've been doing all this work and I'm still here? What the fuck are you going to do about it? That fire... That got hotter and hotter and hotter and wilder and wilder and wilder. And as I started to tune into that, my commitment, my devotion, my soul's yes, my heartfelt desire, my most intimate and expansive visions became clearer and clearer, purer and purer. Now we could be burned by the fire that runs amok within. And we can have that last spark fade into perpetual darkness. Or... We can embrace the fire within. We can accept it, all aspects of ourself, every bit of who we are, the light, the dark, everything in between, the kinky shit that we don't even want to pay attention to, the parts that scare the shit out of ourself, the ones that make our knees buckle, our stomachs churn, our voice shake. Because when we lean into this, when we give ourselves permission to go there, like really go there, This is where we experience our personal power, our sexual desirability, 
our discerning assertiveness, our courage, our passion, our purpose, our presence, who we are, our real fuck yes. And it was once I chose to embrace that fire, once I said, you know what, this is who I am, this is what's up. It wasn't me pushing any longer. It wasn't me fighting for it. It was me saying, you know what? I love you, John Stewart. I love who you are. I love what you've been through. I love what you've experienced. I love how you show up. I love how you've looked at all of this and asked, how can I utilize this as a lesson to be the favorite version of myself? without needing to be perfect, without any attachments to the outcome. And I became the torchbearer of my own life, reclaimed my fuck yes, my soul's yes, my heartfelt desire. I consciously curated life as I wanted it to be with each choice fully engaged with a deeper presence, meeting each moment the best I could, witnessing how my nervous system responded or reacted, participating in this life fully alive, making love with each breath, listening intently, being clear as possible, being tender, witnessing, compassionate, asking for what I want, fully engaging what lights me up from within, living with integrity, integrating practical wisdom, letting go of the need to be right or be perfect or to have that mic drop moment to give more room to play, to be magnetized by my curiosity, to no longer make excuses, to be okay with not being okay, learning to love again, learning to love myself, learning to love this moment right here, to be with what's in front of me, to own when I am emotional, to speak to that, with discernment in the appropriate spaces to be fully, deeply devoted to everything that I say yes to. And if it's not, it's simply a no thank you. And that's okay. It's giving ourselves permission to explore our greatness, to be the favorite version of ourself. My life has always been dedicated to being of service to maximizing human potential and optimizing our well-being. Though as I stated at the beginning of the podcast, I firmly believe that when we heal the wounded masculine and harmonize the polarity between the sexes and integrate the practical wisdom that's available to us, we will witness the greatest shift in consciousness in modern history, if not ever. And I'm so grateful to be able to share my story of how I embraced my inner fire of how I activated and learned to express what it was burning that was deep inside. And there's nothing more than I want than to support others in this journey of what your inner fire is. What lights you up from the inside? What is seeking illumination to come out of the dark and into the experience of our everyday life? We deserve that. You deserve that. Again, this doesn't just apply to those that identify with the masculine. Embracing the fire within is a journey of self-discovery, self-acceptance, self-love, and a guiding practice that's available for us all. It's just that I am invested in being of service to the masculine. We no longer have to go it alone. We don't have to be the lone wolf. We are better together. This is the new paradigm, a more sustainable and harmonious co-creative experience for all in creation. This is why the Embrace the Fire Within program is so powerful and why I believe that coaching, that mentorship, and having a tour guide is one of the most potent relations that we can experience outside of our beloved. There's a shared connection. There's safety, support, confidentiality, shared growth, and profound healing that unfolds. If you can't tell... I'm deeply passionate about supporting people on their journey of self-discovery so that we can live a more harmonious and sustainable lifestyle that supports our heartfelt desires, our soul's yes, our most intimate and expansive vision so that we can remember the soundtrack of our soul, 
how to dance through this life, that we can press play, that there's no need to rewind or fast forward. In fact, we could just pause for the cause. We can let the music play, dance our dance, sing our song, live our full fuck yes right here, right now, together. I've always had a massive vision to facilitate and support the maximization of human potential and global sustainability, restoring harmony and our optimal vibrancy within and throughout. So there's the invitation to go into the fire, through it and beyond it, because we find out that we are so much more capable than we could have ever, ever imagined. This is where we experience life. We feel the sense of aliveness rather than just an awareness of it or an idea. We shift out of the mind into the body led by our heart, our passion, our purpose. We're present with it, for it, making love with it, as it. This is how we embrace the fire within. So once again, thank you very much for listening, for tuning in. I love you all. Have an amazing day. And remember, we are better together. As the sun rises, we wake each day with a question. You know what that question is, don't you? The one that rests in the cavities of your subconscious, playing hide and seek, knocking at the temples of your conscience. It's not so much the question, it's that you know the answer. You know, it's right there. You could just about touch it, taste it. I know you've been there, yeah. You've seen the light, that inner glow from the depths of your soul. It's calling out to you. You too are a seeker for the beacon that shines inside. Are you ready to take it to another level? High above the sky, yet deep within your soul. Elevate, 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 elevate.